Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jay Steele and I'm a software engineer manager at Google. Today I'm gonna be uh, talking about working with technical teams abroad. So I'll kick this off with a little background on me. Uh, here's a couple of the companies I've worked for in the past, including a couple startups on the left, Plasmic and Vigo, and larger companies on the right, BlackBerry and now Google. All of these involve working with engineering teams all across North America and around the world. And you'll see listed on the bottom of each some of the regions involved, some of the cities and areas and, 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 and how it involved working uh, across you know, large geographic divides. I've seen some things go really well, and when it does, it's really rewarding. Uh, and I've also been involved with some pretty challenging environments. Working with decentralized, remote, and international teams is very hard. And this presentation will walk you through some of my own experiences and hopefully give you some tools to inspire you uh, as you go through your own experiences. There are a lot of challenges working with distributed technical teams. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through eight best practices, all of which can be distributed into three major themes. First one is minimizing social distance, then providing the power to communicate and creating a success framework. All of these have foundations in communication. For example, the reason you want to minimize social distance between people is so you can give them the comfort and confidence to communicate. The reason you give people infrastructure and tools is so they have the means to communicate. And the reason you build interaction frameworks is to ensure that the communication has guardrails and purpose. So let's drill into eight best practices for working with technical teams abroad. All of these best practices follow to those three themes that I described previously. And I should note, these best practices aren't unique to distributed teams. You should do this with any team. They're just especially important when working with teams abroad. So let's kick off our eight best practices. Number eight, know your team. This one seems obvious, but in, in the bustle of running a small company, this is really easy to overlook. You'll be busy, they'll be busy, and everything will work out if you just go to the meetings and, and spend time with them, right? Well, it's not quite so easy. You really need to invest in connecting with individuals, learning about what they like, what drives them, what they hate, what they love, learn about what they want to get out of their role in your organization and learn about how they see their career evolving. Why is this important? Well, number one, it helps build trust and it helps open channels of communication between you and them. Number two, it gives you important information about how to model and structure your team based on what, re what really drives people over time. For example, if you learned that a junior member of the team really wanted to become a technical lead, you could provide opportunities for them to learn and grow and, and, and provide a great future for your company down the road. Number seven, structure your team. This one seems obvious, right? But boy, can this get tricky when you're adding the dynamics of a highly distributed team. There are some important things to consider here. So first of all, seniority and experience. You know, your team will be will have junior members, they'll have senior members, and how you divide those people um, uh, around the team will play a key factor. There's also domain expertise and roles. So some members of the team will be you know, specialists in a specific technical vertical, and some will be experts in UX or project management, and you're gonna to wanna to distribute those people amongst, amongst the team appropriately. Where everyone is located and what time zone they're in is, is gonna play a key, key role, especially with distributed teams. So, and you're gonna to wanna to structure your teams to optimize for that. And then finally, how products and services are designed plays a key role as well. For example, you know, you might have an, you might have an application that has two separate tabs where the technology is, is completely independent of each other in those two tabs. You could design teams to focus on, you know, independently on those two tabs. Or you might decide, you know, if your product is a client server model, one team can focus on the front end, one, one team can focus on the back end. All of this has to be factored into team structure, and you need to optimize it for the problems you need to solve. However, there is one important one thing that's very important. You have to be very deliberate and clear about the structure. You have to identify clear roles for various team members within that structure, and you have to communicate it all to the team. Number six, managing technical experience. Engineers typically fall into four levels of experience as they navigate their careers. You know, junior engineers are typically just just getting started, uh, they're very eager, they just wanna pump out code. Intermediate engineers have been around for a year or more, and they're still writing code, but they're starting to dabble in software design and debates, and they're starting to develop opinions about how, you know, how products and features and design should go. Senior engineers are normally three to five years into their careers. They're typically driving designs, providing leadership on small projects, and finally leads, 
are typically five to plus years into their career and they can drive complex projects or even multiple projects and they can even have reports. The best teams manage the ratios of these levels appropriately. For example, a team with all junior engineers is likely gonna struggle to steer the projects appropriately. They can maybe go fast, but they're not gonna go in the right direction. A team with all senior engineers risks overthinking and debating direction and not making enough progress uh, on the little things. Or worse, you could have people in roles that they are under or overqualified to do. And that's not great for morale uh, and, and just team cohesion in the long term. You also need to factor in career growth and hiring. So for example, junior engineers won't stay junior forever. They're going to you know, become intermediate and senior engineers eventually. And you're gonna to have to figure out an appropriate way to backfill them for the future of the, the company. Managing this across distances is pretty important. For example, you may need to have a local lead in a remote office to ensure more junior team members have appropriate leadership. Number five, invest in great tools. So this is really important for highly distributed teams, and I highly recommend investing in getting the best tools for your team, if you can. Don't just think about the obvious ones like email and chat. Consider collaboration tools like video conferencing, calendaring, project management, planning tools, task and defect tracking, support, and even more. Consider asset creation tools like dev environments, release management, UX tools, office tools. Furthermore, focus on how these tools can interop with each other to ensure that they all work seamlessly together. For example, can the support system automatically generate a bug ticket and notify people on email and chat rooms? There's nothing more frustrating to have a whole bunch of tools that you can't make work together. Finally, make, make sure you're investing in training so that team members know how to use these tools. There's nothing worse than spending a lot of money on a tool and then only using 1% of it or maybe even not even using it properly. Uh, last thing actually is, is, and this is often overlooked, invest in best practices and ensure people are using the tools appropriately. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Number four, invest in process. Some people don't like the word process. It makes, makes it feel a little too big company, but you, you really need them. Processes are the train tracks of productivity. I've been there. I've been in environments where people just try to wing it and it just does not work. It's also important to ensure that processes are lightweight and not burdensome. You wanna create repeatable, well-understood steps for achieving goals. You want people understanding what they need to be steering toward every day. You wanna build a culture that values having effective processes. And that's probably your biggest role uh, in all of this. And you wanna let the team actually build and evolve them over time. That way they're bought in. All of this is especially true when working across time zones or continents. The process should factor into into the challenges presented in, uh, in, in the separation that's created here. This makes it more concrete. For example, you want, pro you want processes for project planning, agile execution, product release, UX research, testing, and QA. Uh, all of these things are really important to develop processes for. Number three, build a team roadmap. So this is an internal roadmap. And the number one goal here is to be aspirational and ensure everyone on the team is pointed in the right direction. Uh, this is not a roadmap that you share with customers. It's only kind of a planning tool and it doesn't even have to be 100% accurate. This is a tool to inspire the team about the future. It's like a beacon or a lighthouse. You don't want a team that is completely oblivious to what the next year will bring. To me, that doesn't sound like a happy team. Uh, in addition, this provides agency to distributed teams to make decisions. And that's why this is so important. It helps alleviate confusion or ambiguity in what they need to do. You often only have a couple of hours a day in some cases where you know, you're, you're able to directly communicate. So making sure they can make decisions quickly is absolutely important. Number two, document things. Uh, the importance of this one is amplified tremendously in teams that are distributed across time zones or internationally. Don't rely on storing information in people's brains. For example, if you know someone on the team is the only person who knows how to operate the software release tools, this is a major red flag. What if they were to leave the company? Plan for attrition, plan for worst case scenario. And your job is to build a culture and behavior on the team that values this and helps solve the problem. And proper tools here, which we talked about before, are really key to making this work. Number one, create and adopt team norms. This one is really important. Create a charter of expectations for everyone on the team and let the team define it. Establish norms for mutual respect, build rules for resolving conflicts, create expectations for how everyone on the team expects to be treated and spoken to. If your organization is bridging cu different cultures, be really mindful here. Here's a great opportunity to include everyone while defining this. 
Uh, and this will help facilitate areas where cultural differences could introduce confusion or frustration. Include expectation around meetings, tardiness, respectfulness in conversation and delivering feedback. Include some norms around how to communicate via email, chat rooms, code reviews, and other processes. So I don't think anything here should be tremendously surprising or revolutionary. Most of it should be common sense, but hopefully uh, it'll inspire you to work effectively with your distributed teams. All of these things are best practices for even running simpler co-located engineering teams. It's just that the impact of do not doing them becomes amplified exponentially when dealing with engineering teams bridging long distances and cultures. It's a very challenging problem, but working proactively to get it right can pay huge dividends. So with that, I will wrap. Hopefully my presentation has been valuable for you and thank you for having me.